In the last video, we introduced some more advanced contro controllers, uh, especially motivated by their uh, frequency uh, characteristics. And so one of those is the lead compensator, which is slightly analogous to our PD controller. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the performance of the lead compensator and the additional flexibilities it provides um, by essentially um, where the PD controller has this portion of the controller, we also add this um, pole location. And uh, what we're gonna see is that adds another extra degree of freedom for control design. And uh, so we're gonna try to solve this problem yet again um, with the same uh, open loop plant and the same design criteria. And we'd like to see if our uh, lead compensator can do this. We expect that it can because we've already seen that a PD controller can do this. Um, but we'd like to see what other characteristics can we see um, in the solution of this and what kind of extra benefits we can observe. So go ahead and open up the RL tool and either directly put in this, this uh, transfer function for your controller where you have to assign an initial value of Z and for P, or you can go through the edit compensator window on the RL tool that you already have open uh, for the previous activities. So go ahead and give this a try and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so we already know some of the characteristics of uh, lead compensators. We know that they end up being less sensitive to noise. So this is something that we can appreciate from the Bode diagrams. Um, so uh, what we're going to do once we move over to the RL tool is to demonstrate that we can meet both of these specifications. And so one of the big takeaways here is that the magnitude of the, the gain, uh, essentially one way of d d quantifying that is through that DC gain that we've talked about in the past. Um, the lead compensator requires a DC gain that's a little bit lower uh, than the PD controller. And again, there are lots and lots of solutions, so there are many that have large gain values, uh, but the key is, is that you can push the design a little bit further with this extra degree of freedom that the lead compensator provides with this pole location. So let's go ahead and move over to the uh, RL tool and explore this particular example. Okay, so now in the in MATLAB, we'll pull up the RL tool, and so you can either um, uh, open up this example, uh, entering in the open loop plant, and then a lead, uh, specific design for the lead compensator that you'll start from. Again, this is going to create a zero at a minus two and a pole at minus eight. Both of those are going to be red in the RL tool and allow you to sl slide that around in order to change the controller design. Um, again, because this we want this to be a lead compensator, we have to remember that the, the zero needs to be closer to the origin than the pole. And so that means that this number has to be smaller than, than that one. I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump in directly where we left off. And so this is what we had from the PD controller. And so if I uh, open up this edit compensator window, I still have this real zero. And so I could either um, add a uh, a lead compensator directly, but that ends up being exactly the same as um, adding another real pole. So I could either do that either either way. So I'll, I'll go ahead and show you the way where we add it directly. So I'm going to delete that current one and I'll add a lead. And so now the only difference is, is that you have the pole and the zero location in the same same uh, window instead of having to switch between the two of them. So in this case, uh, we don't want that zero to be located uh, on top of what we already have. So I'm going to shift that off. And, uh, and so now I'll get this out of the way. And again, we're trying to find an overshoot of 10% and a rise time of 0.5. And so again, knowing that, uh, that knowing our sketching rules or the root locus is really going to help us understand how we can affect the overall shape of this by where these poles and zeros are. And in particular, now we have uh, two things to move around. We've got this zero located um, closer to the origin and a pole located farther away from the origin. And then we also have, um, we also can move our poles around based on our gain K. So what you're noticing now, because we've introduced this extra pole from the compensator, that we now have three branches of the root locus. So there's three poles to keep track of. All of them sh really ideally should be in this kind of feasible re range. 
Although this also means that we're deviating farther and farther away from that second order system that we use to design these, these regions. All right, so, um, so right now we have a overshoot that's a little bit too large. And so one of the ways of doing that is to, uh, is to make sure that we pull these branches, the root locus closer to the uh, real axis. So if I move this zero to the left, you can see that that actually goes in the wrong direction. So if I pull this closer, you can see that that pulls these down quite tightly. So if I keep pulling this to the right here, I, I get um, behavior that's going to get me a smaller overshoot. And so now I could perhaps bring these down. And as you notice, it's intuitive that the way this root locus is going, I'm going to be reducing, um, uh, reducing the overshoot by bringing this along this edge in this direction, but I'll also be bringing it slightly closer to the origin, which means that the rise time should be increasing a little bit. And so if we do that, you'll see that the rise time is indeed increasing. And so we can't go too far uh, before we reach our 0.5, but we're doing quite well. And so we're getting quite close to um, uh, our value. We haven't quite gotten down. So you notice that we've almost gone as far down as we can and we haven't quite gotten to this overshoot that we wanted. So one option is to now either pull this further closer to the, uh, to the pole. We can also experiment with changing this. And so what we observe is as we push this closer, it's actually hurting us as well. So one option is to pull that farther away. Um, so a lot of different variables to play with, and you can spend a lot of time uh, working on this example. Um, and, it's, and it's useful to kind of get some in, intuition about how to move these things around to, to change the root locus and to get a better effect. And then also just kind of understand um, how you can fiddle with these uh, iteratively in order to get closer and closer to meeting our time domain specifications exactly, which again is kind of the tightest design uh, design choice that achieves our goals. So here again, we're going to be say moving these down, and now we're getting now we're getting closer. So here, what we've been able to accomplish at this point, we've met our overshoot criteria, and we've also met our rise time. And so by continuing to move these around, you can find alternative solutions. This is one that already matches uh, what we want. Um, and so if we look at where our poles and zeros are, we've got a zero that's located at essentially minus uh, 1.55. We've got a pole that's located at minus 8.8 .8, and we've got a gain, DC gain of 4.4. So this is one solution that gets pretty close. Um, again, uh, it's worth taking the extra time, uh, which I'm not gonna take in this video to kind of manipulate these things repeatedly to get yourself to the point where you're really matching these design specifications almost exactly. Um, and so I'll show you that when we move back into the slides right now. Now just to summarize uh, some findings uh, using the lead compensator for this example, uh, we saw that the lead compensator also is able to meet the time domain specifications and add some extra flexibility. So there are many solutions. Uh, here, what I'm showing is one that achieves our time domain specifications quite accurately. So we're getting very close to what we wanted in terms of time domain specifications. This is accomplished by a lead compensator that has a zero at 1.26, a pole at 5.55, and a corresponding gain at 3.5. So that, that corresponds to a controller that looks like this. And then again, if we go ahead and do that factoring out, we get a transfer function that looks just like this, which uh, this is the K, the K value that we usually uh, describe. And so if we look back at what the what was required uh, in terms of the PD controller, we notice the PD controller used a DC gain of about 5.8. And if we compare that to our DC gain here, it's 3.5. And so we can see that we actually get a little smaller DC gain uh, using the lead compensator than we do by the PD controller. And that's just to emphasize again that uh, using these extra bits of flexibility gives us the opportunity to perhaps improve on the amplitudes of the inputs that we might use in controlling the system. And so 
Again, PD controller accomplishes our goals, but lead compensator allows us to perhaps do that uh, using maybe slightly more sophisticated methods, um, but uh, with some nice attributes. That isn't to say that you always want to use a lead compensator, but it's a, it's a good tool, uh, especially if, uh, for example, you have noise in your system. So some of these other characteristics about the lead compensator can come into play.